The Erd Tree is close, only a little further till the foot of the Erd Tree. And the accord is fulfilled. It takes me back. I was born at the foot of the Erd Tree, where Mother gave me my purpose. Though now, everything is lost to me. I have to ascertain for myself the reason for which I live, burned and bodiless. What's up guys and welcome back to my Lorthro series. While I said last time that I would mainly cover the shorter quest lines in the Altus Plateau in this episode, I found that almost all of them continue immediately in Lane Dell, so I will only quickly cover one of them today, and then spend the rest of the video talking about the open world of the plateau, as well as its optional bosses. If you end up enjoying this video, don't forget to subscribe, as I upload one of these every Thursday. Now do you remember Yura, the bloody finger hunter? He helped us fight a dragon and fend off an invading bloody finger in Limgrave. There you are. That was my first dragon hunt in quite some time. Paired up with a hothead like you. It was just like old times. In return, we helped him with taking out a Ravenmount assassin in Liurnia where he told us his ultimate goal as a bloody finger hunter. I may not have much time. I'm dying to see you. Eleonora. Violet bloody finger. Yes, I've been tracking Eleonora for quite some time. She is the deadliest of all bloody fingers. She's felled many an old hand already, but in spite of her cess-blood salutary, Eleonora is a proud knight. If she comes for you, do not think twice. You must flee. There is no shame in self-preservation. Be on your way. Perhaps we will meet again, if fate permits. But when we get to the Second Church of America, it's already too late. Seems I am no match for you, but I've learned a thing or two myself. You see, I've sliced the finger off. Please. Please, Eleonora. Yield to the cesspit no longer. Do not stain the immaculacy of your soul. Even worse than that, Yura's death is sadly in vain, as Eleonora, even with her finger cut off, still decides to invade us, so we have to take her down too. Eleonora uses both Dragon Communion Incantations and Blood Flame Weapon Arts, of exactly the two factions that Yura has been warning us about all game. This means that Eleonora is most likely the hothead he was hunting dragons with in all times. Which makes it even more tragic for him to see her continuing to yield to the cessblood in his final moments, even after his sacrifice. Before we move on to the Golden Capital, however, we should zoom out a bit from these individual quest lines and take a closer look at the many faces of the Altus Plateau. The most striking enemies of the beautiful golden facade of the Altus Plateau have to be the Lanedale Knights, who have successfully defended the city in three major wars, according to sword memorials. First against the ancient dragons, pre-shattering which ended in an alliance between the knights and the dragons. To this day, most Landell knights are part of the ancient dragon cult and use lightning-based skills. Very close to this sword memorial, one of the key players of this war, the ancient dragon Lanciax, challenges us to a round two after we send him packing around the abandoned coffin. 
After a few deaths, we managed to take down this enemy turned major ally of the city and receive Lanciax's glaive. After the Shattering, the city was first defended against Godric, Godfroy, and the rest of the desperate usurpers of the Golden Lineage. While Godric fled to Stormvale, Godfroy can be found in the Golden Lineage Everjail. While the heroic knight Kristoff, who imprisoned him, is buried in the Sainted Hero's grave and can be obtained as a spirit summon after defeating first the Black Knife Assassin outside of the grave. and then the ancient hero of Zamor inside. The city was then defended again. This time Radan's forces were fended off by Margit the Fellowman, the illusory form of a demigod who, by the way, challenges us a second time just beyond the outer walls of the city. These outer walls are defended on one side by trebuchets, and on the other side by a duo of golden tree sentinels, one of who is holding a sentry's torch. The Knight of the Black Knives could only happen because the cloaks of the assassins were imbued with magic that fooled the eye, turning the assassins invisible to the demigods' guards. The sentry torches are blessed by Morgoth the Omen King with an incantation that dispels this magic so that no Black Knife assassin would ever get past these two tree sentinels. After dispatching of them, we can buy an identical torch at the Hermit Merchant inside the outer walls and then use it to get rid of the invisible assassin in the Sage's Cave. The large parts of the plateau are still under the control of the Golden Order. Most notably, the Windham Catacombs with an Erdtree Burial Watchdog boss, the old Altus Tunnel with a Stone Digger Troll boss, the Sealed Tunnel with an Alabaster Lord boss, and the Oriza's Hero Grave with a Crucible Knight Duo boss, along with the other dungeons that I've already mentioned in this video. The maze-like Oriza's Side Tomb has been taken over by Living Jars and has a Grave Warden Duelist as a boss. And the Altus Tunnel has been taken over by Selian Sorcerers and has a Crystallian Duo boss. Other factions have also found small niches for themselves in the Altus Plateau, most notably Demi-Humans and qu their Queen Gilica in Lux Ruins, and the Bloody Fingers with a Sanguine Noble in the Wrythblood Ruins. Below the golden surface, however, a lot of quite sinister things are happening in the land of the Earth Tree. Perfumers are a group of apothecaries from the capital were tasked with quote-unquote healing, impure creatures that displayed aspects of the Crucible, most notably Omen and Misbegotten. This of course is a futile task as their condition is just the way these creatures are born. And so the perfumers split up, dealing with this paradoxical task in different ways. One section of the perfumers led by perfumer Trisha tried their hardest to stay true to their mission, befriending these creatures in the process, instead of quote-unquote treating them. Trisha herself can be fought in the unsightly catacombs close to the Perfumer Ruins, together with a misbegotten warrior. Some Perfumers, when noticing the misbegotten, Omen and Albanorix are all incurable, went a very different route. They imbibed a physic to rid themselves of emotion and turned to brutally slaughtering them. Omen were treated particularly poorly, with the Omen killers cutting off the Omen's horns, which usually resulted in an agonizing death. We have fought one of these Omen killers before in the Albanoric village, and another awaits us in the Perfumer's Grotto together with Miranda the Blighted Bloom, a flower that the perfumers were harvesting from materials. While some perfumers traveled outside of the Altus Plateau, desperate to find any materials that could help them on their task, a lot of perfumers just started resenting the task they were given. 
renouncing the earth tree altogether and using heretical, self-destructive aromatics, being called the depraved perfumers. One of these was also located in the Albanoric village, as well as a lot of them were found in the Shaded Castle. The presence of those who live in death seems, at least on the surface, to be a bit weaker in the Altus Plateau, as it is the land of the Earth Tree, with there just being a Tipia Mariner at the Wyndham Ruins and a death bird, not even a death right bird, close to the Hermit Merchant's shack inside the outer wall. However, once you get to the Bower of Bounty in the center of the Altus Plateau, this illusion is really shattered as this area, uh, although filled with relics of the Earth Tree's prime, is by far the most severely corrupted place we've found so far, as one of the many worm faces out here is actively defending the minor Earth Tree in the same way as an Earth Tree avatar. I suspect these creatures were not born this way, but rather corrupted by eating of the contaminated soil here. Death Blight has even spread to the minor earth tree inside the outer Landale walls, as there are plenty of skeletons around there, and even a small but easy to miss cult of death worshippers who use death sorceries and are completely unique in the game. We will skip over the Windmill Village and its pagan skinning ritual for now, since we already covered it in our video about Millicent. Now, having explored the most important parts of the Altus Plateau, we have two more ways to go, as this finger reader crone tells us. You... please... I can read them. Your fingers... please, your fingers... Since we've already covered a large part of the NPC questlines of Mount Gelmir and the Volcano Manor in previous episodes, we'll finish Mount Gelmir in the next episode and then move into the best part of the game, in my opinion, the Royal Capital. So stay tuned! If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe or tell me what your favorite faction in the Altus Plateau is down in the comments. I'll see you next time, bye bye!